afternoon, everyone. What an extraordinary <coughs> panel we have. After a day of so many fascinating conversations on these important issues, I'm just struck by the experience, the perspective of this incredible group of leaders. <coughs> And if I were to really go through all of their biographies and histories, we'd have no time left for questions. So please go through. <laughs> <laughs> In August of 1932, John Sidney McCain was born. In Panama. Well, thanks for starting us off with some laughter. Let me begin first by, of course, saying to all of you that you know they're great biographies, and we hope today to have a lively conversation about the ways in which the White House and the Department of Defense intersect, at times effectively, at times causing controversy, at times causing sleepless nights for the people that we have before us. So let me begin by first saying a welcome to our guests. Let me begin with Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. Before in serving this position, he was also general counsel at the Department of Defense and general counsel for the Air Force. And he is perhaps the person I'm hoping most to extract news from today, but I've been given some guidance that might not be too likely, so we'll see how I do. Then, of course, to my immediate right, Senator John McCain, who is poised to become the chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the new <coughs> Senate. And you know his long background working on these national security issues, uh, the nominee of his party in 2008 for president, perhaps running again in 2016 for his Senate seat, hoping maybe, that maybe, maybe for president. Maybe for president. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> And in covering Senator McCain in 2008, I got to know his mother, Roberta, and his wife, Cindy. And so I know all the ways in which he is truly the son of a Navy wife and the husband of a Blue Star mom. And it comes out in this today as well. Secretary Gates, Robert Gates, who has served as not only the Secretary of Defense, but the Director of the CIA, Eagle Scout, President of the Boy Scouts of America, University President, so many different Storylines, author of a book that apparently no one is noticing anything about. <laughs> Same true for Secretary Panetta. <laughs> Dust is gathering on that book. No one is talking about that. <clears throat> Secretary Leon Panetta, of course, who served as the head of the Department of Defense, the director of the CIA, chief of staff to President Clinton, Office of Management and Budget, and of course, we're in California, so he's a former member of the House repre representing this great state. And Stephen Hadley, who I had the pleasure of covering during my time covering the Bush White House, served as National Security Advisor to President Bush, served in the Department of Defense during the presidencies of George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan. He has brought the perspective from the private sector as well as inside the Oval Office when decisions were being made on some of these issues. So what an extraordinary panel. The advice I got from Secretary Panetta, drop the puck and let them go at it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how we do. Let me begin by asking sort of a general question to each of you and bring your experience and your perhaps behind the scenes insight. Uh, let me start all the way at the end with Stephen Hadley. From your perspective, advising both from the White House end and the Department of Defense, where do you see the most difficult point of intersection? Where did you have a moment where the White House's intentions and the Department of defense's intentions really were at odds? What would be a moment that comes to you? Well, I think one of them was when we looked, when the president decided in 2005 we needed a new strategy in Iraq, that the strategy we had was not working, and this resulted in a process that was uh, uh, <clears throat> ultimately called the surge. Um, and this was a decision that the president was moving toward. Um, but there was a, a, a lot of discussion about how that decision should be made. And I think one of the president's things that the president understood very clearly was that he needed to have his military leadership on board with any new direction of strategy that he would make. That, you know, this was not something where 
he could make the decision and, and they would salute. But that was not what he wanted. He wanted to have his military on board because he knew that a dispute between the president and his mil senior military officers in time of war is potentially a constitutional crisis. Secondly, he knew that if there was a split within his military between those who favored an increase of troops and a change of mission and those who did not, that tension would both frustrate the success of the implementation of the mission and would be used by the Congress to uh, argue against the shift in strategy. So one of the things he did was to spend a lot of time in the NSC process, bringing his cabinet together, bringing his Secretary of State, bringing his Vice President, bringing the Secretary of Defense along, and then finally in a fairly climactic meeting met with the chairmen of the Joint Chiefs in the tank, uh, and Bob, Bob Gates was there, and he uh, really brought them along in a very spirited discussion, and he's written about it in his book, and, and one of the military leaders said, you know, you're breaking the force, Mr. President, with all these rotations, and he said, I understand the strain on the force, but I also know that you way, the way you really break a force is to lose a war. So what do you need? in order to make this work, that we can have a change of strategy and can uh, give some relief to our men and women in uniform. And that's why the decision to change the strategy in Iraq was accompanied by a decision to increase the size of the force to give a broader uh, rotation base so that people did not see these indefinite rotations. I think it was, uh, you know, there's an academic literature that says, you know, one model is the president always ought to defer to the military what they want to say strategically is right. Another model which says the president decides and the military salutes. The reality, of course, is neither of those. And I think this was an example where the president, understanding the military, having supported the military, knew he needed to bring them along and did so. And the end of the day, the military was uh, both the incoming commanders, the outgoing commanders were on board with the decision. Some leaned to the right, some leaned to the left, but everybody was in the same boat. And that was important to getting it uh, accepted by the American people, accepted by the Congress, and then to be implemented effectively on the ground. I think that's a, a, a good example of how the president needs to interact with his senior military officers. Secretary Panetta, you have written about some of your concerns about this point of intersection between the department and the White House. Can you give us a behind the scenes moment that would give us a sense of what you were feeling at the time when there was a critical de decision and there was some dissonance between the White House and the Pentagon? Well, you know, you, uh, you obviously, in capacity as uh, Secretary of Defense, as Bob knows, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues that uh, you, know, you have to confront uh, that uh, oftentimes wind up at a National Security Council. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the nature of a National Security Council has, has changed a lot in that you know, it, uh, one, one of the concerns I frankly have is that you know, over a period of maybe 25 or 30 years, there's been an increasing centralization of power at the White House, uh, in which, uh, you know, whether it's national security advisors or advisors in other areas, that uh, what, what happens is you begin to build up a large staff at the White House, and it begins to impact in terms of the departments and their ability to be able to be heard at the White House and to be able to uh, guide policy. Uh, and so I, I think there's something inherently that ultimately has to, has to change because what's happening now is because of that centralization of, uh, of authority at the White House, there are too few voices that are being heard in terms of the ability to uh, make decisions. And that includes members of the cabinet uh, and others that oftentimes go to a National Security Council meeting. But by the time you get there, uh, the fact is that the staff has probably already, in many ways, determined what the president should or should not do. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way this process is beginning to work. Now, you know, I mean, my view is a National Security Council ought to be a place where Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, the key people in the administration sit around a table 
and their voices are heard. And even though their voices may be, you know, not in agreement with uh, what should or should not happen uh, according to the staff, those voices should be heard and options then prepared for the president in terms of a decision that the president has to make. That's the way the process should work. Uh, and too often it sometimes doesn't work that way where you, you go there and by the time you get to, uh, uh, to the White House, uh, the, you know, the staff has already decided or tried to influence what the direction should be. And so rather than having a really good give and take, you begin to get kind of uh, sidetracked in terms of where the decision ought to be. Uh, you know, but my, my experiences were both good and bad. I, mean, I had a good experience dealing with the White House on uh, the effort to design a new defense strategy. We were handed a number of $487 billion to uh, reduce the budget. Uh, that, you know, it's almost a $500 billion cut on top of other cuts that uh, uh, Secretary Gates uh, had, had implemented. So the challenge of how to do that, to just, you know, do I just slash across the board or do I try to use that as an opportunity to develop a new defense strategy for the 21st century. And I thought it was an opportunity, based on my own budget experience, to use that as a way to develop a defense strategy for the 21st century. Uh, and so we did that in-house, working with military leaders and the civilian leaders, uh, and basically structured what we thought ought to be the key elements for that. And then, rather than kind of going to the National Security Council, uh, I took it directly to the president and we briefed the president uh, on what we were doing. And in many ways, that ability to kind of present it directly to the president uh, and get him to buy <laughs> into the defense strategy and actually hear his views and be able to adjust the strategy based on his views gave us a head start so that by the time we went to the National Security Council, we had basically put the key elements of a defense strategy in place had the support of the president, had the support of military leaders, had the support of civilian leaders, and we were able to get it through. Uh, and uh, you know that was kind of a reaction to what I, the concern I had that if I didn't do it that way, I might ultimately be undermined uh, in the White House in terms of our ability to put that together. So that's just one example of how it worked effectively. There are a lot of examples where it didn't work effectively. Dr. Gates, you were the first Secretary of Defense asked to stay in that position by an incoming president. So you've had the view from two parties, two White Houses. Can you give us some insight about the obstacles you would run up against in dealing with the White House while you were trying to manage the Pentagon? I think the first thing <clears throat> to remember is that there is a long history of presidents and senior military leaders disagree uh, on how to proceed. Um, the stories are legion of President Lincoln and his generals. Uh, people tend to forget that General Marshall and FDR disagreed on some fundamental aspects of strategy before World War II. Uh, people know about Truman and MacArthur. Eisenhower overruling the unanimous vote of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to use nuclear weapons in Indochina in 1954. Uh, and I saw it with the first President Bush, uh, unhappy with the military's reluctance to put enough force into Saudi Arabia to actually expel Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Um, they had 200 plus thousand troops in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and that's pretty much where they wanted to stay. And he kept insisting on an offensive strategy. And then, you know, Steve put a good face on it, but the reality is when it came to the surge, you had both the theater commander and the commander of central command who were adamantly against the surge. And ultimately, they did not publicly criticize it. Uh, but they and others in the leadership did not agree with the president's decision. Uh, others did, and, and the president was able to bring people along, uh, ultimately. And then, and then finally, the disagreements, uh, particularly over Afghanistan uh, in the Obama administration and the surge in Afghanistan. So there's a long history of this uh, disagreement, and so it shouldn't be seen as anom anomalous or 
as, uh, as a, a critical commentary on a president that he disagreed with the military. Um, most of the time, when our presidents have disagreed with the military, the presidents have been right on all the issues that I just, uh, for example, that I just, all the examples that I just mentioned. The thing that I find, where I found the greatest concern, uh, really uh, was the first president I served and the last president I served. And in both cases, Lyndon Johnson and Barack Obama, it was White House micromanagement of military affairs. And <clears throat> I mean, people remember the stories of Lyndon Johnson sitting down in the Situation Room picking military targets uh, and so on. And the thing that Leon referred to the size of the NSC staff, at one point I asked the National Security Advisor in 2010, how many people uh, he had working on Iraq and Afghanistan, and the answer was 25. That was half the size of the entire NSC when uh, Brent Scowcroft was National Security Advisor and I was his deputy. And my reaction was, you have 25 people in the NSC working on a single military problem, they are going to be doing things they shouldn't be doing <laughs> to justify their existence. And it was that micromanagement that, that drove me crazy. Uh, I certainly, I was at opposite ends of the chain of command in 1966 and, and <laughs> 2010, but, uh, but it, it was a very great concern to me. And that, more than presidents and military disagreeing with one another, I think is, is an object lesson. And I will tell you that with both of the presidents Bush, once they gave the order, there was no micromanagement. The first President Bush, once he got the strategic equation settled with the military, backed off and let them plan the campaign. And after the president, second President Bush ordered the surge, he let David Petraeus figure out how to make it work. And I didn't have any problems with micromanagement uh, in those cases. So I think that one of the concerns as we look to the future, and here I'm reinforcing Leon's point, we now have an NSC of nearly 350 people. It was 50 when Brent and I were there and in the first Bush administration. And, and so my concern in terms of this relationship between the White House and, and the military is not on the big issues. Those things get sorted out, I think, the way historically they should. But it's in, it's in the increasing desire of the White House to control and manage every aspect of military affairs. I'll just end with an anecdote. I was touring uh, the uh, JSOC uh, headquarters in Kabul and <clears throat> discovered a direct line to somebody on the NSC and I had him tear it out while I was standing. <laughs> and I told the commanders, you get a call from the White House, you tell them to go to hell and call me. <laughs> so it sounds like you're describing a bureaucratic mission creep in a way. Well, I don't know. <clears throat> I think it's, <clears throat> I think when a, when a president wants highly centralized control in the White House at the degree of micromanagement that I'm describing, that's not bureaucratic, that's political. Secretary Johnson, you have a portfolio right now that's dealing with lots of issues from Ebola to immigration to concerns about lone actors that might be in the United States. You've also been counsel for the Department of Defense. What have you found most challenging about trying to navigate between those two roles? Uh, well, it's interesting going from being a lawyer to a client. <laughs> I love being able to say, as I used to hear Robert Gates and Leon Panetta say, let the lawyers work it out. <laughs> uh, and then resisting the temptation to practice law myself. Um, 
I have a lot of thoughts about what the prior panelists said. First of all, um, tribute to Buck McKeon for putting this together. Your convening power is quite impressive. <laughs> I feel like I'm part of Murderer's Row here. Uh, number three in the lineup, but uh, tribute to Buck McKeon for that. Um, <clears throat> look, I think that um, when you talk about the relationship between the White House, the NSC, and the Department of Defense, uh, in theory, the President's the Commander-in-Chief. He gets all the advice he can before he makes a decision. He makes a decision, the military salutes smartly and carries out the mission, whatever the mission is. There are times, very clearly, when it is good to get the support of the Department of Defense. Uh, <clears throat> the most obvious example uh, I can think of is the exercise Bob Gates and I went through in 2010 with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the difficult personal issue, personnel issue. And <clears throat> we, were, we were simply not going to get the buy-in of every man and woman in the Department of Defense in the United States military to repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. One of the things that I, that I learned from Bob Gates <clears throat> is which I have tried in my current job and in the last job uh, to practice is if at least people feel like they've been heard on a, on a difficult issue, uh, then they will respect and, and support your judgment. So we spent 10 months canvassing the force about the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We hold 400,000 service members, 150,000 spouses, uh, and in the end, the Congress repealed the law. And I think people felt like they had been heard. Uh, even in the <clears throat> counterterrorism mission, you know, before I took the job of general counsel of the Department of Defense, I was a corporate lawyer. And I can't say that in corporate law you get to learn a lot about special ops. So I had to spend, I made it my business to spend a lot of time in that world understanding the mission, understanding how they go about their job, understanding the risk to force, the risk to mission, um, and understanding the gravity of what it is that I was being asked to sign off on legally before I made a decision. And sometimes I would say yes, and sometimes I had to say no. And I think because the, the men and women in uniform knew that I understood their role in the complexity of their job, they, they could respect the instances when I, when I said no. Um, my department is the third largest department of government. It's, it's, very, it's very big, it's 22 components, it's 240,000 people uh, under an overarching umbrella of homeland security. And <clears throat> it's not as mature as the Department of Defense, very clearly. Uh, but there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from, from DOD that I've learned from, from Leon Panetta and Bob Gates about how to run a big, big department like that. One is to have a good chief of staff who keeps you on, on mission, keeps you focused. Um, always, have, always have good lawyers um, <laughs> and let them work it out. Let them work out the complexity of some of the issues. You were also at sort of a white hot spotlight moment with immigration and the work you've been doing to counsel the president on what he may do on that issue. Have you concluded what the president should do regarding deportations? Well, um, we're in the final stages of developing some executive actions. Last year, uh, with the leadership of uh, Senator McCain, the Senate passed a terrific bill, in my view. Uh, by a vote of, I think, 68 to 32, bipartisan bill that would have reformed the immigration system in a comprehensive fashion. Uh, unfortunately, the House did not act last year, and it doesn't look as if it's gonna act this year on that. Meanwhile, we have a broken immigration system uh, in a number of respects. The more I delve into it, the more problems I see, frankly. And so we've spent a lot of time over the last several months, identifying ways across a whole spectrum of issues 
to reform the system within the confines of our existing legal authorities. There are a lot of things a cabinet secretary can do within the confines of existing legal authority to fix the system that he administers. And the immigration system's got a lot of problems, and we're going to do that, and um, it will be comprehensive. The president hasn't made final decisions yet. I suspect he will very soon. I suspect we'll have an announcement before the end of the year. Um, but <clears throat> it will be comprehensive. Uh, much of it will be um, strengthening border security. We had a situation on the southwest border last, last summer with a lot of kids crossing into the border, and we had to surge resources to, to, to address the situation. Fortunately, the numbers are down the lowest they've been in almost two years, but we've got to sustain what we put in place there and uh, continue to build capacity in the event there's another spike like, this, like the one we had last summer. And so part of the reforms are are uh, to strengthen our border security. I believe that's important. Senator McCain, you've pleaded with the president not to act on that. Uh, you've pleaded with the president to do more with respect to Syria. Your role with the gavel come January is one where you can try to bring pressure uh, through oversight and through being a voice on national security issues. You've had a lot of those moments where there's been conflict with the White House. What is perhaps something you haven't shared publicly before or an insight you can offer about that intersection of where you bumped up against the White House and tried to move policy? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be on the, with these members of the panel who are outstanding Americans. Thank you, Buck, for making this happen, and especially Leon Panetta. He and I were in Congress together, many of you may recall, during the Coolidge administration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with him, um, could I? There are a number of areas where there's disagreement. Uh, obviously, I'd like to see the president give the new Congress some time to see if we would move forward on immigration reform. I believe that. Majority, the Speaker uh, Boehner now has a larger number of members that gives him some cushion, and I believe, by the way, it has to start in the House, any immigration reform. Lindsay and I are tired of walking the plank, but, um, uh, and so, I, I, what I worry about is that with an environment that may lead towards some kind of uh, effort on immigration reform, and we have been on this issue now, in my own case, for eight years, that uh, we could at least give the new Congress a chance to act. Apparently, that's not going to happen. I think it's going to cause severe repercussions. The one thing that I, that I would like to do in my new job is work with the president. We are now seeing the world in a state of disarray and threats that I have never seen the likes of, of which in my lifetime. <clears throat> I am seeing, again, the Vietnam movie with this targeting uh, and the way this conflict is being conducted, separating Syria from Iraq is, I mean, no, no, no one believes that that is a, a viable option, watching the Free Syrian Army getting slaughtered, some of whom I have known personally breaks my heart. But let, let me just mention one example, uh, one time to you that I think is really seminal when you, uh, in answer to your first question, and that was when, when the surge started. You may remember that, and there was then at that time 59 votes in the United States Senate to withdraw everybody from Iraq. And we had a hearing in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and it was David Petraeus and Ryan Crocker it was probably, I think many of you would agree, one of the most remarkable hearings that we have ever had. Through the sheer ability to describe what needed to be done, uh, David Petraeus and Ryan Crocker were able to turn many members of the United States Senate around and around to the point where the surge was supported sufficiently that, in my view, it, it succeeded. Now we're gonna face in the issue of Iraq and Syria, 
the authorization, again, the authorization for the use of military force. That is an obligation of Congress. It isn't a privilege because we are all responsible for what happens to our young men and women who are serving in the military. And this is going to come up. And I don't think Congress should duck it. And yet, at the same time, I have some concern, and I would certainly bow to the individuals here who have been on that side. I worry about a too restrictive authorization of the use of military force, which not only may inhibit our ability to win this conflict, but would set a precedent that would curb the constitutional authority of the President of the United States. So this will be a very, very interesting and important debate that's going to come up on the authorization of the use of military force uh, in Iraq and, and Syria. And Speaker Boehner has said he would like the White House to craft that force and to send it they to Congress. They should send it over. And I, one of the questions then is, if it is too limited, does that hamper what the Defense Department can do? And when we see General Dempsey in Iraq with his unannounced visit now and talking about assessing the potential for ground forces, whether those be US or coalition, or what have you, is that preparing for another stage, preparing no. the public? No, what he's doing is re recognizing reality. First, there was going to be no boots on the ground. Then we're going to have a few hundred boots on the ground. Just again, this is the Vietnam. Uh, there's going to be a gradual escalation. They're going to have to send more over there. They're going to have to have four air controllers on the ground. They're going to have to have special forces people. We're going to have to have trainers. I mean, and at some point, we're going to recognize that ISIS does not respect boundaries between Syria and Iraq. And at some point, maybe, we will not allow the most immoral thing I've seen in my lifetime, and that is train and equip young Syrians to go in and fight while we allow Bashar Assad to barrel bomb them and slaughter them. Uh, that, that's, I can't tell you how, how it's terrible I, th I think that is, but I don't think that's going to be connected to the, uh, I think it's going to be connected to the reality on the battlefield. Is ISIS, is ISIS winning or losing? My dear friends, when they're not winning, when they are not losing, they are, and they, they are winning by having now control over a part of that, both those countries larger than the state of Indiana. And the things that are going on, aren't, aren't we horrified that they've, they've, they've declared enslavement of women is in keeping with Sharia law? Someone saw the news articles this morning, how they're selling young women to each other. My God, when are we gonna be offended? When is it somehow going to uh, offend the things we believe in and stand for? Secretary Panetta, do you foresee an expansion of the U.S. role with a component that would be more conventional boots on the ground? Is that politically possible now? Well, look, uh, we, are, we are confronting uh, an enemy that I think is every bit as dangerous uh, and as terrorist uh, and as uh, as evil as Al Qaeda, uh, and as a result of that, you know, the president was right to declare war uh, on ISIS and to uh, state that we are going to disrupt and ultimately defeat ISIS. Uh, and the reason we do that is not because ISIS is just a threat to Iraq or to Syria or to the Middle East, because it's a th they're a threat to the United States. They've made that very clear, that if given the opportunity, uh, they will attack this country. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, they represent a national security threat to the United States. So you know, my view is that this is, uh, this is a mission of uh, you know, doing everything we can to ensure that we do disrupt and ultimately defeat them. Uh, and yes, you know, we'll, we'll work with the Iraqis. Yes, we'll help train them. Yes, we'll help give them uh, the support that they need, uh, the air support they need, and hopefully they will be the ones that will uh, assume the primary responsibility of pushing ISIS uh, out of Iraq. And yes, we are going to train uh, and hopefully uh, arm uh, elements of the opposition in Syria uh, to uh, eventually do the same thing, to be able to go after ISIS and 
and then uh, hopefully to go after Assad as well. Uh, but I think it is important for the president, and I think it's important for our military leaders to know that they have to be able to use every possible option on the table in order to be able to succeed in that effort. And that we ought not to just ad hoc limit certain areas, not necessarily because we're going to use it, because you never tell your enemy what the hell you're going to do. Based on that, you know, I'm willing to, you know, to rely obviously on our military leaders, people like General Dempsey and others, to be able to provide the best guidance as to how do we, what do we have to do to make sure that we defeat ISIS. That's, that's the mission. That's the goal. And if it takes, you know, additional boots on the ground, if it takes an effort to ensure that uh, our people are moving with them uh, as they go into battle, uh, then I think that's something that uh, we ought to pay attention to. So the key here is to keep our eye on the ball, to keep our eye on the target. And we, it, as a result of 9-11, we were attacked. 3,000 people died. We declared war on terrorism. We declared war on Al-Qaeda. And we went after Al-Qaeda. And we did a pretty damn good job of uh, undermining their leadership. We now have a situation where Terrorism has metastasized to ISIS and to other parts of the world. We've got Boko Haram, we've got Al-Shabaab, we've got different elements of terrorism that are out there. We have a responsibility to go after those who would attack this country. Why? Because we, we have sworn an oath to keep this country safe. And if we're going to do that, then I think we have to be flexible enough and wise enough to do everything we need to do in order to ensure that evil doesn't prevail. Secretary Johnson, would you counsel the president to pull back on his public comments about not having a combat presence, boots on the ground, in the way that he has? Would you counsel him to pull back from that, given the discussion we're hearing? Uh, well, as a cabinet officer, I'm not in the business of publicly saying how I would counsel my boss. But uh, <laughs> look, there's, there's an aspect to our current counterterrorism <clears throat> efforts that I hope everybody in this room appreciates. I'm sure the gentlemen up here do, which is this. What's new about the terrorist threat to the homeland, which I'm focused on in my current job, are a couple of things over the last 13 years since 9-11. 9-11, we were attacked by an organization that had a relatively, relatively for a non-state actor, traditional command and control structure, where there was a command, there was an order, people were sent into this country, they attacked us. Now, we see the rise of a couple of things. First of all, these groups are much more splintered, it's more complex, but we see the rise of social media, um, ISIL is as slick as any organization, terrorist organization I've ever seen at social media, <clears throat> literature, propaganda, and we see the phenomenon of, of foreign fighters, people who leave their home country, go to Syria, link up with extremists, and then will return home, either to this country or to a country <clears throat> for which we do not require a visa to travel here. So what I'm focused on what we're focused on as a government, and we need to be, uh, <clears throat> first of all, es efforts domestically. Um, we've, we've enhanced the information we're seeking from people who travel from visa waiver countries. Um, we're doing a number of other things to work with our allies on knowing individuals of suspicion when they travel. Uh, but one of the things we've got to do in this country is build relationships with community organizations that themselves have the ability to reach somebody in this country who's already here who may turn to violence. The threat of another lone wolf type attack, like we saw at the Boston Marathon last year, 
uh, is something uppermost on my mind, which could happen on a moment's notice uh, without a lot of advance notice from our intelligence community or even our law enforcement community. And so we have our countering violent extremism efforts. I'm personally committed to it. Um, I've been to Chicago, Columbus, Ohio. I was with an Islamic center in uh, Minneapolis last week with um, uh, some Somali American leaders. And I was a couple of days ago here in Los Angeles in an Islamic center. Um, to build trust with these organizations and these groups who themselves can support us in our efforts in um, dissuading people from turning in this direction, who are here in this country, who may be inspired by something they read, see, or hear from ISIL without ever having met a single other person from that terrorist organization. And are those organizations in a way, in a position to give you feedback or to be able to see things? Absolutely, absolutely. And the, you know, what they say to me is, well, you just want me to be an informant. You that's, want me to- That's the mistrust. You want me to be a, want me to be a stoolie or something like that. And I, my response is, we need public support and participation in our homeland security efforts. Um, <clears throat> it's everybody's homeland, it's everybody's public safety, it's everybody's country. Uh, we need you to work with us uh, to identify potential threats to the homeland. And how likely do you think it is? Is there any metric you can put to it for the potential for that kind of an acting out that you wouldn't hear chatter about, that you wouldn't have much well, it's, it's, stuff about? Well, it's difficult to measure. Um, I think our FBI, our law enforcement, does a good job of detecting terrorist plots in the homeland at the early stages and interdicting them and arresting the individuals. But one of the things we hear constantly from community organizations is we need a counter narrative. We can't just expect somebody to say, okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn to violence. There needs to be a counter narrative, a counter message. And the government itself is not in the best position to to build that. And so we gotta work with these groups and we are working with these groups to build a a counter narrative um, for somebody before they even start thinking about committing overt acts toward, toward terrorism. Mr. Hadley, in the hat that you have had of being able to craft policy and advice to a president <clears throat> in a political firestorm, what would you say to President Obama about the issues in Syria or with ISIL in terms of how he might manage the balance of a changing dynamic on the ground, the growing threat, and sort of the identity he's had in his presidency of wanting to remove the U.S. from some of these conflicts. Well, he's, uh, I think he's done a couple things uh, right. Uh, one, I, I, um, I would have to say, I think it's late in coming, but I think, uh, years late in coming, but I, may, I think he made the right decision with respect to Iraq and Syria. Uh, I think the rollout was actually quite good, you know, it was very organized and systematic. Uh, it's the first, uh, he tried in, in a, I think, a pretty good speech to explain to the American people what uh, is at stake. And he didn't put a, a deadline. I think this is the first deployment he's ever announced where there wasn't a deadline and an end state, and rather he said, this is going to be the work into the next administration. I think that's all good. I think one of the things I would probably advise him is, he has a reputation and a pattern of when he uses military force to start out with what he's not going to do before he tells you what he is going to do. And I think one of the things I would say to him is, Mr. President, in this case, you need to go counter to type. You need to turn it around. And you ought to be making the emphasis on what you're going to do and showing some steadfastness. Look, George W. Bush. Everybody knew he was willing to use the instrument and be steadfast. The question was, would he be sometimes restrained? <laughs> President Obama has the different problem. Everybody expects him to be restrained. He's now got to be steadfast and committed. Uh, and so I think in, he, he needs to sort of flip around his normal uh, explanatory advice. The second thing is something I learned from President Bush, who gave speech after speech on the war on terror. And, 
I, I came to him one time and I said, Mr. President, you're giving all these speeches on the war on terror. How about a speech on something else, like your development strategy in Africa, some, you know, positive thing? And he said, well, okay, have they give me a speech like that, but have a couple paragraphs in there on the war on terror. So I gave him, <laughs> I gave him three paragraphs up front on the war on terror, and then a terrific speech on development. And he said, well, you know, it doesn't, the, the terror stuff, you know, you don't tell what the threat is, and what our objective is, and why it's important for the American people. So by the time we got done, it was a speech on the war on terror with three paragraphs at the end of the development. And I said, Mr. President, you know, I mean, I don't get it. He says, Hadley, you don't get it. And he said something which I think President Obama needs to keep in mind. When American troops are engaged in harm's way, you need to be talking about it all the time. Why it's important, what your strategy is, and why we're going to succeed and that you're going to see it through. Your enemies need to hear it. Your friends need to hear it. The men and women in uniform need to hear it, and their families back home need to hear it. That's what I would say. I hope the president you know, continues to talk and explain to the American people why this is important and conveys a sense of commitment that he is going to see it through. That's what we need. who has been talking about how uh, the military has been engaged in some of these critical fights of late is a man named Robert O'Neill, who is a former Navy SEAL who identifies himself as the shooter who, <clears throat> among those on the team, killed Osama bin Laden. Secretary Gates and Secretary Panetta, do you think it's appropriate for him to talk about this in the way that he has? Is there a code being broken, but is there also potentially a positive in informing the public about such an important mission? <clears throat> My view is that uh, you should not be doing it. It is a violation of the code. Uh, I expect he will be ostracized for the rest of his life by other SEALs. Uh, it is not their culture. Uh, and, and I think it's a, a serious mistake. I think that when you when you begin identifying, either self-identifying or uh, having others try to identify those who participate in these kinds of raids, uh, you increase the risk. I visited uh, the team that carried out the raid uh, at their uh, headquarters uh, just three days after they got back. And I was joking with them. I said, you guys have been debriefed a lot <clears throat> would you like for me to debrief you on what was going on in Washington uh, while you guys were over there? But one of the things, the concerns they raised with me was concern, actually, now these, these, are, these are serious people. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were deeply concerned about the safety of their families because there were so many reporters scouring around their neighborhood trying to identify who they were. Now, of course, my first thought was that a reporter's worst nightmare would be confronting one of these guys' families. <laughs> <clears throat> but... I could see that. So, so, I, I, so that's, my, that, that's my take on that. But can I make a couple of comments on some of the Floor other... Floor is yours, First of all, I think there is a gap between the, pre the president's rhetoric in terms of the objectives and the mission that he sets for the military and then the uh, authorization that he gives them to carry it out. He has given them the mission of destroying ISIS. First of all, that in itself, I think, is very ambitious. We have been trying to destroy Al-Qaeda for 13 years, and it's still very much a work in progress. But when you then say, deny the military the kind of authorities that they require to achieve the objective, you leave them with a great sense of frustration. Now, I haven't talked with uh, 
anybody who is currently on duty, I, and I wouldn't want to get them in trouble, even if I had. But I believe, as Senator McCain and Leon have said, these guys cannot even degrade ISIS. They can slow it down and maybe, maybe take back some territory, but they cannot seriously degrade <laughs> ISIS without having special forces, embedded training, trainers and advisors, uh, and forward air spotters or forward air controllers. It simply can't be done. And it was the same kind of problem we had in 2010, 2000, yeah, 2009, really, with Afghanistan. The president set some very ambitious goals for what we were going to achieve in Afghanistan in February and March of 2009. And then when Stan McChrystal said what it would take to accomplish the objectives the president had set, the price was too high. And that was the controversy that Leon and I sat through for three months in the fall of 2009. So the first point is, the president's rhetoric and the authorizations that he gives to the military need to be more in the same ballpark. The second thing is, the president of the United States cannot make a threat, cannot draw a red line, and not fulfill, not carry it out. It's, I always told the presidents that I worked for, don't cock that pistol unless you're ready to fire it. Because when the President of the United States makes a threat, the credibility of this entire country is on the line. And it sends a powerful message. to our adversaries, whether it's ISIS or anybody else, when we don't follow through on threats that we make. And the third and final point that I would make is that we are sending a signal that the United States is weary, that we're tired of foreign engagement. And the more we talk about coming home and about nation building at home, the less we talk about the conflicts that we're in, the more it sends the signal that we are. And as, and as Condry Rice has said, great powers can't get tired. Russia's not tired, China's not tired, ISIS isn't tired. And one signal that we could send, that we intend to remain engaged and carry out the policies that are necessary to protect this country and our interests and those of our allies, is A, get rid of this incredibly stupid sequestration of the defense budget. And second, stop the current cuts in the defense budget. Day before, day before yesterday, I presided at the decommissioning of the last uh, Harry class frigate in Everett. Those ships were built in the Reagan era. All of those ships are aging out and are gonna be decommissioned. But that ship is being decommissioned five years early because of budget stringencies. And I know that some people have talked about, well, we have all this new technology on our ships, <coughs> things that they can do that, that earlier ships can't do. Well, the one thing they can't do no matter how powerful their technology is, defy the laws of physics, and be in the South China Sea and the Persian Gulf at the same time. <laughs> so, I felt like I needed to make those points because they tie very much into this question of how we deal with ISIS, how we're perceived, and what, what it takes to, re to begin to reverse that perception. I mean, let me, if I can, I take, uh, uh, I think Bob has, uh, you know, hit some very important points, and uh, let, let me just add because I think I think it's important uh, for this audience uh, and for those that care about, uh, you know, how we deal with with national security issues uh, to understand, at least from my viewpoint, that perhaps the greatest threat to our national security 
is the dysfunction in Washington and the inability of both the President and the Congress to be able to work together to deal with, uh, with any of the issues that are important to this country. I mean, you know, we're talking about this crazy sequester, which was developed as an, an insane approach. I mean, it, it, as Bob points out, it's like, you know, the guy in blazing saddles who put the gun to his head <laughs> and said, uh, you know, uh, if you don't do what's right, I'm going to blow my head off. Well, <laughs> Congress did the same damn thing with sequester. They developed this crazy mechanism, uh, you know, this slash across the board, and it was, it was to be so bad that it would force them to do a deal on the budget. So they don't do a deal on the budget, and sequester is going to happen. Now, there was, there was nobody I talked to who didn't think sequester was damaging to the country. I, Secretary of Defense, I went to the President, I went to the leadership uh, on the Hill, both Republican and Democrat, and I said, look, I said, this thing is going to do incredible damage. On defense, it's going to impact on our readiness, it's going to affect our ability to deploy, it's going to affect maintenance, it's going to affect, you know, the, the squadrons we can put in the air, and eight, by the way, 800,000 people are going to be put on furlough. It's going to be very damaging to defense. And they said, you know, you're absolutely right. So I said, okay. <laughs> so we're just going to, we're going to do damage to the country. So what do we do about it? And I, I, at the time, I said, oh, if you need a hundred billion more in defense savings in order to cut a deal, you know, I'm willing to, to put that on the table. And they said, you know, that's very generous. But nothing happened. Nothing happened. There was no group that kind of sat in a room and said, maybe we need to solve this. And so sequester happens. And it does damage on the domestic side, and it does damage on the defense side. But there were political gains. Pardon me? I believe that there was a holding of the budget line that had some political benefit, and I don't hear a lot of talk on Capitol Hill about rolling it back or changing it. Well, I think that, and that's, that's a concern, because frankly, what needs to be done is a budget deal. They need to be able to do a budget deal that includes savings on entitlements and it does and, and does tax revenues and tax reform. That's the deal they should have done a long time ago. And the failure to do that deal results in these stupid CRs kicking the can down the road. It results in sequester. It results in a situation where this country, I mean, if you care about the defense budget, the greatest concern I have in the defense budget is total uncertainty about what the hell's going to happen. And if you don't know what's going to happen, how do you deal with these issues? How do you deal with the war? I mean, now we're dealing with the war because we get OCO funding. Well, that's fine. But it doesn't deal with all of the other budget issues that you have to confront. So at some point, and I know, you know, we just came out of an election in which I think the American people expressed a hell of a lot of anger about what was going on in Washington. If you care about national defense, at some point, and you care about this country, at some point, president and the leadership, other than just talking about it, have to get down to business and start cutting deals rather than poking each other in the eye. Republicans will have control of both houses. Do you think there is an appetite to change sequestration? Do you think there is an appetite to do the sort of deals that Secretary Panetta is talking about? I think there has to be, and it has to be our first priority. Um, I promise you that Lindsey Graham and I and Kelly Ayotte and a number of others will make it our highest priority. Uh, it, it's got to change. These two individuals who just spoke, that's credentials enough, I would hope, for any member uh, of Congress. Um, by the way, you know, it, uh, our approval rating is, what, 13 percent, 14 percent? Uh, is there anybody here that is in the 13, 14 percent? Paid staffers and blood relatives. If you are, I'd like to know where the hell you've been. But the, uh, uh, Kelly, I mean, yeah, we have to. We have to fix it. And I'm happy to tell you that some of the new members that were elected are of our wing of the party. McCain, Graham, L.A. Ayotte wing of the party, uh, Joni Ernst, although I'm still worried about some cutting that she wants to 
of the pork variety? Is that what you were referring to? Well, she said she was going to do that in March. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Sullivan, who uh, from Alaska, Dan National Sullivan. Guard, Tom Cotton. There's a number uh, who are very heavily defense uh, oriented. Uh, but before we leave this, could I just, I, I don't think we could complete this conversation without a word about Ukraine. My friends, Ukraine is being dismembered as we speak. These good and wonderful people are being slaughtered. Do you know that over 4,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed? Uh, that's, that's as many as we lost uh, in Iraq. Uh, and we will not give them weapons to defend themselves. When I tell people that, they don't believe it. They don't believe that here's a country dismembered by Vladimir Putin. And by the way, he's moving south, and then he will move west uh, because he's getting away with it. That anybody remember the shoot down of the airliner? And and so the president talked about that today at the summit in Australia, where Putin. Well, then is. why doesn't he give weapons to the Ukrainians so, for God's sake, they could defend themselves? Murphy and I stood and spoke to over 200,000 people in a square in sub-freezing temperature in the Maidan. They want freedom. They don't want to be part of Russia. They want to be part of Europe. They want a, a, a government that's not like Yanukovych and his predecessors that, that's corrupt. And we need to help them. And believe me, if Vladimir Putin gets away with this dismemberment of Ukraine, that's not his last target. Look at the Baltics. Look at Moldova. Look what just happened in Georgia. They just threw out all the pro-Western people in their government. This beat is going to go on until Mr. Putin believes there's such a thing as peace through strength on the part of the United States of America. I'm distraught. I am distraught about sequester. We are now having captains and majors in the United States Army on, in combat in Afghanistan that are receiving notices that they are being involuntarily separated from the United States Army. Do you know what signal that sent? you know what the gust of morale? There's people who've served in the military, military here who know that. It's devastating. And what we're doing is what we did before. And we've seen this movie before when, uh, uh, in the pre-Reagan era. And by the way, what we're doing is we're eating into operational readiness and training, which means our people are less ready. You don't see it in the, so much in retirement of the ship, although that's going on, but they're not able to train. They're not able to equip. They're not able to be ready in a, in a world that is, in my view, arguably much more dangerous than it was when sequestration was enacted. Thank you, Senator. Let me just add one sentence to that, just to further what Senator McCain has said. Because of the way sequestration is structured, and particularly the exclusion of personnel uh, and benefits, almost all of the cuts in sequestration come in operations, maintenance, and training, and delayed, and delayed modernization. So the consequences for the troops that are already out there and deployed are significant. I mean, you know, you, you read. At one point during sequestration, uh, a, a third of the Air Force's active duty wings were ground zero. We don't have two aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf because we can't afford it. I sent, I got President's approval to send a second carrier to the Gulf under President Bush. And we had one there in terms of deterring Iran until sequestration came in and the Harry S. Truman, we couldn't afford to send it. So there are real consequences to this thing. It's not just rhetorical. And how quickly can, if the spigot is turned back on, can you restore the readiness to the level that you're talking about? Well, that's the problem. That, I mean, the, the, the Defense Department is not some kind of a sloop that you can just quickly maneuver around. It's, a, it's the biggest aircraft here. It's the biggest oil tanker in the world. And it takes a while to turn these things around and to get the funds back into the pipeline. And what do you do about the young officers and enlisted that are being put out. How do you replace those, them and their experience? These things, that's the thing that the Congress doesn't seem to understand is that these things have long-term consequences. Even if you were to get rid of sequester tomorrow, the consequences will still be felt for years to come. I think the, the, estimates, still, are, the estimates are 20 still feeling that in the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Could I just add one point that I think you would agree also 
that if we do stop it, then that really gives them a chance to plan, it gives them a chance to operate. As serious as the blows have already been, if we could say, okay, it's over, not just a two-year extension and uh, pause, then I think it would have a significant impact on all the issues that, that you just described. It's clearly the rawest of nerves for this panel. Secretary Johnson, how have you seen sequester affect your department? Well, my department is essentially a civilian national security public safety department. And you can just imagine how sequestration has affected uh, the civilian components of our department, even the Coast Guard. We're still feeling the aftershocks of sequestration. The Coast Guard has had to cut back on operations, some pretty important operations. Uh, it's affected every single component of our department, and it still reverberates. And I hope that Congress can, can deal with it because sequestration is just not smart government. Mr. Headley? Just a small point. It's, it's good to focus on how long it would take from the getting rid of sequestration for the department to heal and the forces to heal. But there's a strategic significance here. And if we were to rescind sequestration and rescind the defense cuts, it will be read around the world. It will be a message to the Chinese that their military buildup will not be unanswered. It will be a message to Vladimir Putin in terms of what he's doing. It'll be a message to ISIS about our will and commitment to the fight. So that's a kind of good news that we could deliver at a strategic level, which would begin to advance our ability to deal with these problems internationally. Can I close the loop on something with you, Secretary Panetta, regarding Robert O'Neill? One of his concerns, again, the Navy SEAL, is that your cooperation at the time with the agency, with the film, might have been a mixed message about what he should do. What is your sense of the appropriateness of his speaking out? Well, look, it, uh, CIA, anybody who, as we have now, all kinds of CIA uh, activities in, in terms of films and television, uh, CIA does you know, uh, try to cooperate so that they don't get the, the wrong message coming out. We, we've done that throughout our history at the CIA. But, I mean, my, my concern, frankly, is that people ought to abide by the rules. If, they, if there's a rule, if you're, going to, if you're going to write about something, as I wrote about something, you've got to run that by the CIA, and you've got to run that by DOD. And very frankly, one of these guys didn't even do that. And so, you know, I, I, if, if they want to write a book, fine. But they also have to abide by the rules, which is to present it to the CIA, let them go through it, determine what's classified, what should be taken out, and the same thing with regards to DOD. Uh, and if they do, if they follow the rules, then fine. But if they don't, then I think uh, they do have to pay a penalty. And with your own book and some of the criticism about your comments about the president and you as well, Secretary Gates, I know you probably thought and anticipated some of that in the writing. Has there been anything in the criticism that has caught you by surprise? or in the way people have focused on some of the things you've said or written about the president's judgments? Well, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like Bob Gates' book. I mean, you know, we, we, we write a book, it's about 500 pages, and I've got about three paragraphs on Obama. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and people, uh, obviously the press pays attention uh, to those issues. But, you know, look, at the same time, you know, I, I don't, I think it's healthy to have a debate in this country. I think it's important to be able to talk about uh, you know, what, what the president does that's right and what the president does that's wrong. I mean, that's the nature of our democracy, for goodness sake. Even during I think, his presidency? I think, I, think it was, I think it was Winston, let me just, Winston Churchill said something about criticism is not very agreeable, but it is necessary. Uh, and criticism is like a pain in the human body. It tells you that something unhealthy is going on. And so, you know, I, I think the ability to be able to have that debate and to learn, I mean, presidents, you know, they hear an awful lot of people that tell them how great they're doing. They don't hear a lot of people that tell them what's going wrong. And that's one of the problems, frankly, uh, about, you know, the ability to, to lead this country. You need to have people that are not only telling you what you do right, but also the mistakes that you make so you can fix them. And every president I know that is an effective leader, learns from the mistakes that were made. 
and, and deals with that in terms of the future. And I, I think as, as, as a result of uh, the debates that we've had and some of the points that both Bob and I have made, that frankly this president has learned. I mean, the fact is we have troops back in Iraq. The fact is we are doing airstrikes in Syria. The fact is that we are now arming and training the rebels. And the president, I think, as a result, has learned that uh, those are steps that need to be taken if we're serious about dealing with terrorism. Secretary Jones, uh, do you find it unhelpful when it's happening while President Obama is still in office? All I got to say is <laughs> when I leave the public service, I'm writing a book about model railroading. <laughs> Criticized while still in office. Let me let me let me just say this. Um, as a cabinet officer and as the lawyer for these two gentlemen over here, I think they can I think they can attest to the fact that there are times when your advisor to the Secretary of Defense or the President, and you we were talking about the NSC staff earlier. When you see things are going in a certain direction with a certain momentum. You have to just take a deep breath because you know that the president is owed your best, honest, candid advice, and you just say what you have to say, even if it's going to disrupt a lot of things and upset a lot of people. That's 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 why we're all here. And <clears throat> I have to I have to respectfully disagree with the notion that we can seek the support of the American people and even the Congress um, by, by asking for their support for an unlimited armed conflict in the Middle East, another, another armed conflict in the Middle East. I think given the reality of where we are 13 years after 9-11, uh, even in the Congress, and I'm, I'm glad the Congress will take up an authorization to use military force, there are going to be a lot of colleagues of Senator McCain who will immediately ask, well, what are you getting me into? What am I being asked to vote for? I'm not going to vote for an open-ended armed conflict. I just won't support that. And so um, armed conflict these days, I think the public wants to know what the parameters are going to be uh, before we send uh, a lot of men and women into harm's way again. But Jay, I agree with you that the American people have no desire or interest in refighting the Iraq war and sending 100,000 troops there. But between zero boots on the ground and sending brigades and divisions and corps into Iraq, there are a lot of options. And, and I think that if you, think, if you talk in terms of special, and, and I agree with the President, the main ground forces for this conflict, conflict have to, at least in Iraq, have to be um, uh, the Iraqi troops, it has to be the Sunni tribes, and it has to be the Kurdish Peshmerga. In Syria, it has to be Syrians. But they cannot be successful without American advisors. And the key is, and particularly once the president has set the mission of destroying ISIS, so you have to come back to what I was saying earlier, the gap between the, the objective the president has set and the means with which he has authorized its achievement. And, and my argument is that we're talking about, uh, about hundreds of troops in an advisory role, potentially, uh, as well as air power and so on. I think, I think the, the, the challenge for the president is, is to figure out where he draws the line so that you don't get back into sending tens of thousands of American troops back in there, especially if the Iraqis aren't carrying the fight themselves. But, but to say that, it's, that, that the only choices are doing nothing or sending an American army back into Iraq, I think is a false choice. I, and, you know. I also point out, if your goal, as the President stated it, is to degrade and, uh, and destroy ISIS, then let's have a strategy that will match that. No military person I know, no one, it's outside of 
the Joint Chiefs of Staff believes that we now have a strategy to achieve that goal. So if you don't want to send a thousand of troops, if they're weary, as you say, Mr. Secretary, then let's leave ISIS alone. Let's not tell the American people that we're going to destroy ISIS when anybody will tell you that right now we do not have the, uh, the strategy uh, to fix that. And, and I'd also like to point out, you know, we always, this rhetoric I love, we were, we were doomed to lose in Iraq. My friends, we had a surge and we had the situation stabilized. It was under control. And then this president decided to pull everybody out. And Lindsey Graham and I and a couple others predicted everything that's going to happen. And I'll tell you this right now, Mr. Secretary, we pull everybody out of Afghanistan, you're going to see the Iraq movie again. And, you know, it, it, sometimes I get a little emotional. I was a... Uh, <laughs> Don't hold back, sir. I, I, was, I was campaigning for our Senate candidates. Most of them, in spite of my effort, won. And uh, I was at a veterans thing in, in, uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana. A young man came up and he said, Senator, I was in the Second Battle of Fallujah. In case many of you have forgotten, we lost 86 soldiers and Marines killed, several hundred wounded. Bloodiest battle of the war. He said, three of my, three of my friends uh, were murdered. And my platoon were killed in action in, in the Second Battle of Fallujah. He said, and now the black flag of ISIS flies over the city of Fallujah. He said, tell me, Senator, what do I tell their mothers? We had it stabilized. Thanks to the surge, we had it won. And a decision was made, Mr. Secretary, to pull everybody out, because that was his campaign promise, and now we're paying a hell of a heavy price for it. winding down and I appreciate the, the passions that are here on these important issues. If I could ask uh, this esteemed group to do something as a sort of lightweight, as a lightning round, may I ask each of you to share just one thought in conclusion about perhaps a rough lesson you learned personally in your leadership on these issues that might be an example to a future national security leader. A mistake made, an observation missed, uh, a lesson that came either at the time or the time proved to show it to you that there might have been another way. Would each of you share just very briefly a thought about something you have learned that might be of use to the next generation of leaders? Um, <clears throat> I would say this. I've been in public service four times. Uh, I've been in the private sector a lot. Uh, it is an increasingly complex world. Um, and. Sometimes the choices look easier on the outside. Now, sometimes that could be healthy to have that perspective one step removed from going to the situation room once a week and wrestling with these really, really difficult issues, which includes advice from our military. And so I've, <clears throat> I've learned from uh, my time in and out of government that uh, it's important to carefully assess all the, all the parameters of our decisions. Uh, there's blowback one way or another to every choice you make, and very few things are black and white. Robert Gates is right. It's not, it's not a choice between doing all or nothing, and I don't think we've gone down that road at all. Um, we're heavily engaged right now in the Middle East. Uh, we're doing airstrikes uh, on a daily basis. So um, we're, we're committed to taking the fight to a very dangerous terrorist organization. Uh, and it is necessary that we commit our military assets to doing that, and that's what we're doing. Secretary Gates, any lesson? You've written about it in your memoir, but is there anything you want to share today that might be of a guidepost for a future leader? I joined uh, CIA 48 years ago this last August. And I've spent my, most of my adult life and more time than I'd like to consider since 1974 in the Situation Room. And so I've watched presidents go to war. I've tried, seen presidents try to end wars. And we have to have the strategic toughness to be willing to do hard things. Uh, and that includes send, sending our men and women in the battle. The President has to, and the Secretary of Defense, uh, the National Security Leadership, has to make the tough decisions to protect the country. But during the period, the days before my confirmation hearings, 
was having dinner in a hotel room uh, in D.C. alone, or in a hotel dining room. And a middle-aged lady came up to me and said, are you Mr. Gates, the new Secretary of Defense? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, congratulations. And then with tears in her eyes, she said, I have two sons in Iraq. For God's sake, bring them home alive. We can't ever forget the human cost of the strategic decisions that we make. Secretary Panetta, any words from your hard lessons learned? You know, I, I, I often tell the uh, students at uh, our Panetta Institute that uh, in a democracy we govern either by leadership or by crisis. Uh, and if leadership is there and willing to take the risks that are associated with leadership, then I think uh, a lot can be done not only to, to avoid crisis, but certainly to control it in the future. Um, my concern today is that, you know, I have, it, in my 50 years in Washington, I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. I have seen Washington work. I've seen leadership work. I've seen John McCain work with uh, Republican counterparts to uh, develop legislation. I saw Tip O'Neill and Bob Michael work together to resolve their issues. I saw Bob Dole, George Mitchell, uh, and others work together to, uh, to be able to solve the issues that, we, that face this country and take risks, and take risks. But my concern today is that we are doing more and more by crisis. We're governing by crisis. Rather than confronting these issues, we allow them to just become so critical that ultimately it's the crisis that drives action. And rather than then dealing with the crisis, uh, generally the, the approach is, well, let's just kick the can down the road rather than confronting it. So I, I, I think we have to get back to a point where both the president, leadership of Congress, and those that, uh, you know, that now had uh, the, the key committees there have to be willing to take risks that may offend members in their own party, but do the right thing. And the president has to do the same thing. The president's got to make decisions that may offend people in the Democratic Party. But the key right now, and I think the message that's coming from the American people, is that we have to stop this gridlock and this stalemate and this constant game of political blamesmanship, and that we have to be able to <coughs> work together to solve some of these issues. I, if we spend another two and a half years of stalemate, and that may happen, I think it's going to do incredible damage to our economy and to our national security. I think the time has come when leaders are going to have to be willing to take the risks that may cost them politically, but at least will put this country on a better path for the future. And in our final moments, Mr. Hadley, is there something that you would counsel a future leader who will advise a future president, maybe 45, 46, 47, based on the hard lessons you have learned? What would you say to that future national security advisor? Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I want to answer a little bit differently, if I could. Sure. One of the things I've observed is who, you know, leadership really matters, and who you elect to head your country really matters. Um, you know, sometimes people say, you know, it doesn't matter, it's a, a constellation of forces that will force people uh, to sort of make similar decisions. If you look at uh, historical figures, the character and leadership skills of the person elected is almost everything. It really matters. Second of all, I think the most challenging task of any president is this role of commander-in-chief. And as we go into another election in 2016, I think the American people, in these conversations about foreign policy, that's fine on the merits, but what they really ought to be looking at is, is this person someone who can lead this country in time of challenge and in time potentially of war? Because that's what we're looking at over the next decade. And leadership style and strength and courage are terribly important. I saw 
and Senator McCain saw it, you know, in 2005 and six, we were losing Iraq. And President Bush made a very difficult decision, and Senator McCain's support was critical, to do the surge. And when he announced that decision in January 2007, the stunned silence across the country was palpable. People could not believe he was going to do what he did. And there was a period of nine months or a year where I would say to you that the force of will of the President of the United States was the only thing that was keeping it all clued together. You go into these situation rooms, you look at people around them, the room and they were all looking at the president to see is he getting weak in the knees at this surge or not. And at the same time, he was committed to it uh, in the tradition of Ron Reagan and a lot of other great leaders. <coughs> he also came to me at one point uh, right before he made the surge decision. He looked up and he said, Hadley, is this, is this going to work? Now, as a national security advisor, that's an important moment. <laughs> And I said, Mr. President, I think it will work, but I also think it's our last shot. And he said, well, good, I'm glad to hear you see that. But then he said, hear you say that, if you ever change your mind, you need to come into this office and tell me. Because if we don't have a strategy that works, I can't send these young men and women into harm's way. I think that's the framework and the mindset you want in a president in a time of war. And Senator McCain, as we conclude here, do you think these issues will drive the next presidential contest? I think uh, obviously it depends on what's doing on in the, going on in the world. And Kelly, could I thank you for the great job you've done moderating these egos. And <laughs> Hardly anybody I think I might knows. have been running 10 steps behind most of the way, but I think the audience was all right with that. Hardly anybody here knows that you're a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> he used to call me Shanty Irish on the 2008 campaign, which, if you are Irish, is a very, very endearing <laughs> remark. <laughs> You know, a few days ago, uh, we honored our veterans. Uh, in every major city and small town and village in America, we honored our veterans and gave them the respect and appreciation and affection that they are due. Uh, quite a few years ago, when I came home from the Vietnam War, this nation was very badly divided, probably more divided than it had been since our Civil War. And unfortunately, our veterans were not on it. In fact, our veterans were mistreated to a large degree because people blamed them, the 18, 19-year-old draftees, for their as part of their opposition to the war. And it bothered me a great deal. And then some years later, we had the opportunity to try to reconcile with our enemy, uh, what, who was our enemy. And after a long period of time, after recon resolving the missing in action POW issue, we normalized relations between our two countries. Today, one of our best friends in Asia is Vietnam. They're far from a perfect country, but the fact is that we have a friendship which is very deep, and we have a Vietnamese community in the United States which has done marvelous and wonderful contributions to our society and our nation. So I guess one of the takeaways that I have, despite the differences that we have and that, that this nation is capable of rising above these difficulties, we are the only nation I know that's capable and ready and willing to reconcile with our enemy. And despite the challenges and the difficulties we're facing now, I still have great faith in the future of the greatest experiment in history. Thank you all for your time.